Now, if you would this afternoon, take your Bibles and look with me in the book of Ephesians in chapter number three. Ephesians chapter three. I want to begin the reading of our context in verse 14. So if you would, follow with me beginning in verse 14 of Ephesians 3. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit, through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory, to Him be glory, in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want to begin this afternoon by sharing with you sort of an overview of the text to get a proper understanding. The preface of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians begins with a reason. He says, for this reason. It's interesting that commentators are divided over what the reason is. Some believe it has to do with the reason back in verse 1 in the chapter which points to the end of chapter 2. Paul says that the reason I am held captive is for preaching the gospel and its benefits to the Gentiles. But other commentators believe that the reason speaks of the advantage that the gospel affords them in the previous verse here, which is to encourage them not to lose heart, not to be faint-hearted or discouraged. I have a tendency to lean toward that position. In light of all that the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ has taken the initiative to accomplish for the Gentiles, Paul is moved to drop to his knees and to pray for the saints of Ephesus. To pray that the benefits of the gospel might be fully grasped by the saints of Ephesus. His posture here in prayer is no sham and no formality. It's sincere. He's concerned and so his natural response, reaction to their need is that he falls on his face before God and he prays for these saints. You'll notice that his prayer here possesses both petition and praise. Paul requests that the Ephesians might be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man but also then he offers up thanks to God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think. Now listen. Today we look at this one of six different prayers of the apostle that we have recorded in the inspired volume. Verse 15 reveals the impartiality of God as He is a Father both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. And interestingly, from both groups, He has called His elect and united them together 
as the whole family in heaven and earth. This is the purpose of the book of Ephesians. That they might be reminded that through the gospel, God has called both Jew and Gentile to be united in the person of his son. You see that, which I agree with Martin Lloyd-Jones, that the pivotal verse there, the central verse that gives us the whole theme of Ephesians is Ephesians 1 and verse 10. But therefore, the phrase refers to the common bond. When he says the whole family in heaven and earth, it refers to the common bond of all who have been reconciled with the Father through Christ. It does not refer to God giving each child a name in his family. But rather it speaks of all God's children, whether Jew or Gentile, whether they're in heaven or earth, being under the same Father. In other words, he says that we are all of the same spiritual faith family. Al Barnes makes this comment. The expression here is taken from the custom in a family where all bear the name of the head of the family. And the meaning is this, that all in heaven and on earth are united under one head and constitute one community. Now, when you look at Paul's petition here, you might get the impression that he's asking for a multitude of things. I mean, the content is rich. And if you only read quickly through it or look at it at a glance, you might think he's praying for a number of different specific things for the saints of Ephesus. But it's interesting that he's only praying for one thing. The result is, if God does come and answer that prayer, there are multiple blessings and benefits. Listen to this. His request is that they might be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. The petition is that the inner man of every believer would be quickened, spiritually quickened by the Holy Ghost, to grasp the riches of His glory, which are abundance and inexhaustible. When the Father, listen, when the Father grants this request, the saints in Ephesus will experience a more conscious awareness of eternal realities, which we'll look at in a moment. But let me give them to you at a glance. These include, now this is important, the felt realities. As much as we appreciate the foundational teaching of the Word of God and all the objective content in the canon of Scripture, friend, this is profoundly subjective. Now you hold on to your seat belts. You better listen very carefully. There are four felt realities that Paul says will be the result of being strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. First of all is the reality of a felt Christ. A felt Christ. The felt reality of Christ dwelling in the hearts Secondly, is a rooting and grounding in love which encompasses all relationships. Not only vertical, but also horizontal. There are so great a dimensions of love that you and I have yet to experience. I can honestly say with no pride in my heart that I am tasting of this. I am learning to love people that are absolutely unlikable. It's amazing. It is nothing short of supernatural. But another felt reality is 
a spiritual comprehension of the love of Christ that supersedes, surpasses the intellect, knowledge. And then finally is a total domination of God in the life. That's not sinless perfection. But I'm talking about knowing the affirming presence of God that you sense that everything that you say and think or do and do are under the governing influence of the Lord God Almighty. Now, now, brothers and sisters, if you don't let the Bible speak for itself, when you come to texts like this, if you've got a prejudice, you're going to miss it. I think the Bible has the capability of standing on its own two feet. Don't you? But now you listen to this to complete the introduction. You will note that while Paul never uses the term revival or spiritual awakening, this is exactly what he is describing. It's the nature of one. For example, you see that he mentions a greater dimension of love, both in our love for others and our love for God. If you've studied church history at all and you've gleaned from the spiritual awakenings, you know what they refer to those movements of God? You know how they refer to them? Showers of love. Whereas one man said, when he encountered God in a revival, he says, love flowed knee deep. All the prejudice and all the sectarianism and all the division were just swallowed up in love, the grace of love. There was a greater love for God and others and a greater understanding of his love for his people that were evident in spiritual awakenings. You want to know why? Because God took the field. These people knew God. They walked with God. They loved God. God was using them. Souls were saved before the revival came. But when the revival came, suddenly all these spiritual realities were catapulted into a dimension that people were not used to experience, experiencing because God was at the center. So that's what I want to talk about. What it means to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. Three things once again this afternoon. Number one, I want to underscore in this message the need for effectual, effectual prayer. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 and 16, Paul said, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that He would grant you He's praying for the people. Paul was a praying man. His lifestyle of prayer revealed how weak he knew he was in effecting change in the Ephesians. It's interesting. The guy is an apostle. He is multi-spiritually gifted. He has a track record that almost borders on infinite. He's called into the third heaven. He knows spiritual giants of his day. He's gleaned a multitude of wisdom through painful experiences, through what he has suffered for the gospel. And yet, listen to me, friend, he never resorts to the arm of the flesh. He never resorts to the wisdom God's given him or what he's experienced in the kingdom of God. He is a praying man. My point is this. 
His lifestyle of prayer revealed how weak he knew he was in effecting change, even in the lives of the Ephesians. He was aware that what he had written to them and prayed for them would be in vain unless the Spirit strengthened them to lay hold of these glorious realities. Some this afternoon in the church, your Christianity is too casual. It's convenient. They do if it's convenient. He was earnestly engaged in prayer. Think about this. But do we have the same confidence in prayer or in our God in prayer as Paul did? I ask you this afternoon very simply, do you pray? Do we know anything of our utter weakness? Here's my point. Is our prayerlessness an acknowledgement that we are too dependent on ourselves? I'd much rather talk about theology than to pray. I'd much rather preach than pray. I really would enjoy hanging out with the brethren far more than I would enjoy being alone with God in prayer. But as S.T. Gordon says, you could do nothing greater than pray until you've prayed, and you could do nothing greater than pray than after you've prayed. The apostle was a praying man. Paul prayed often for the Ephesians and his ongoing pleas for them revealed his continued dependence on the Lord. Consider how often he prayed, even in the very letter that is penned under divine inspiration here. He prayed for them in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 23, when he asked God to give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation for their spiritual advantage in the, knowing the hope of his calling. That's assurance, friend. If you don't know what that means, that's assurance. He's praying for their assurance and the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the exceeding greatness of his power toward them. This is what he's praying for. So he's praying for the people. He prays again in Ephesians chapter 3 for their spiritual understanding that through an enabling of the Spirit they might be able to grasp the divine benefits that he mentions here for their walk with God. And then you skip ahead in Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about putting on the whole armor of God and praying always with all supplication in the Spirit. By the way, that's why we put on the whole armor of God. Is to pray and to supplicate in prayer. That's where the real warfare is. And then he continues to display his weakness in himself. In Ephesians 6 and verse 18 again. Here he is putting on the whole armor of God to pray. This is the thing I want to underscore. Paul prayed. He prayed because he recognized his inability to effect change. And he prayed faithfully because he continued to be consciously aware of his helplessness. Listen, people. If there's one thing that is a great disappointment today among the church at large is the abounding self-sufficiency of ministers and lay people that is acknowledged through their prayerlessness. They ask, Conrad Murrow one time said, who could you recommend to come in and preach a conference on prayer? And he said, well, that's very hard because the people who pray never talk about it and the people who talk about it never pray. That's right. It's a great conversation piece, isn't it? 
So we spend endless hours talking about it, but how many of us really pray? Like Stephen Oford said, they used to have a little child's song they would sing, how often do I say my prayers, but do I really pray? We're talking about effectual prayer. So Paul is a praying man. There is a great need for effectual prayer. But secondly, you see in his prayer here the need for the Spirit's enablement. The Spirit's enablement. Uh, Martin asked me if I would preach to you on the two fillings of the Holy Spirit. By the way, there are two distinct fillings of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. There's the Ephesians 5.18 for sanctification. But there's this coming up on this endowment of the Holy Spirit for usefulness or proclamation. And I wish we had time, but unfortunately, the last time, which was months ago, when I preached on that, Martin, the person didn't return my notes. So I wish I could have spoken it, but it's at home on the computer, so maybe I can send it later. <laughs> okay. But I see more and more in the Scripture where the Holy Spirit is underscoring the importance of the enablement of the Holy Spirit. He says to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Listen now. Throughout Paul's letters to churches and individuals, he uses such phrases as by the spirit, through the spirit, in the spirit. He's dependent on the Father for his petitions, but he relies upon the Holy Ghost to quicken those petitions in the hearts of his people. In Ephesians alone, you see Paul's consciousness of the Spirit's work. Listen, brethren, Ephesians 2 and verse 22, he speaks of being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In Ephesians 3 and verse 5, reveal by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Ephesians once again, chapter 3 and verse 16, to be strengthened with might by the Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How about this? Ephesians 5 and verse 18, to be filled, be not drunk with wine, but literally in the Greek there is, but be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 6 and verse 17, we clothe ourselves with the whole armor of God, that we might take to ourselves the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And Ephesians, the very next verse in verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I'll not tarry long, listen to me. The point I want to make is how desperately we need to be consciously aware of the Holy Spirit. It was said of Spurgeon, his vast intellect, his grasp of biblical theology, his Christ-centered preaching, but yet he desperately, like Paul, recognized how much he needed the Holy Ghost. And so they said, as he got ready to walk into the pulpit, with every pace that he would take, as he would climb up into the holy desk to deliver the word of God, he would say over and over again in a prayerful whisper, I need the Holy Ghost. And you and I desperately need the Holy Ghost, friend. We've seen the best that man can produce. But are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Have we taken the initiative as fathers and mothers and ministers of God in securing the help and the aid and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in the discharge of our duties? Have you ever heard someone describe the enabling of the Spirit? Many people will preface their testimony with these words. I can't explain it, but he did something for me. I, I, it's hard for me to convey the concept, but God helped me by his spirit. It may have been utterance to speak. It may have been suddenly just a sudden spontaneous thought that came 
that was a righteous thought and gave you clear direction. It may have been a sense of the presence of God that you don't encounter in common ordinary life, but the Spirit quickened. And you say, the only way I can describe it is, I can't describe it. But God did something. We need the Spirit's enablement. Now, thirdly, we get to the main point, and that is the need of experiential reality. Look at Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19 again. It would be good if we could just once again reflect on this. Let me read it and think about what I read here. Verse 17, why are we to be strengthened with might through the Spirit? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Secondly, that you might be rooted and grounded in love. Thirdly, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes, goes beyond the intellect, knowledge. And fourthly, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Just one comment here. I really think John Piper is right on. The book he wrote, God is the Gospel, is so biblical. Why did God take the initiative to do what he did through his son? Is to give us himself. That we might enjoy God. Not just enjoy God, but enjoy all the fullness of God. And so we'll look at that in a moment. But very quickly, let me hasten. And I want you to look at these four things, these, these blessings that come as a result of the Holy Spirit's strengthening grace. He says, first of all, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You know what this, what this is teaching? A felt Christ. A felt Christ. You will notice the word that refers to something previous that has occurred. Once again, to be strengthened with might. The matter that the Word points to is the work of the Spirit who comes in response to the petition and makes Christ real to His people in a greater degree. It is a marvelous thing when the Spirit, brethren, comes and makes one keenly aware that Jesus is in the midst. Have you ever had an experience of this magnitude? Have you ever been up late at night or early in the morning? Have you ever been in an event like this? And the Son of God drew feelingly near The night after my conversion, I prayed with my Bible college roommate. We were so hungry for God. And we went down into a room where they didn't require everybody to turn their lights out, and we prayed through the night. And, and friend, ignorant, didn't know a lot of theology. One verse of scripture I knew was John 3.16. And I tried to use it on the street with a man one day and, and botched it up. I couldn't remember the whole verse. And the guy I was witnessing to finished the verse for me. <laughs> but but I, I was hungry for God. And, and my roommate and I, we went downstairs. And here was our strategy. While one would praise and worship, the other would petition and intercede. And so we'd pray like 45 minutes or an hour, and then we would switch up. And we just kept praying. And then we'd take a little break, and we'd talk. And then we go back to prayer again. We wanted God to come. A little after four o'clock in the morning, Christ manifested his presence. You say, well, what would you call that? The glory of God. 
my face went between my knees and I literally pressed my hands to my brow on each side to cut my eyes from looking out for fear that I might see the glory of God and not live to tell about it. I noticed at that precise second my roommate, his voice quivered. He was experiencing the same thing. And here I am, we've been pleading for God to come. And when he came, now we're trembling and saying, please depart from us. We are sinful men. And just a few seconds later, the presence left the room. And I looked up at my roommate, Bruce, and I said, Bruce, did you sense that? And he said, I sure did. I said, what did you sense? He said, I sensed that Jesus walked into the room. And I said, that's exactly what I sensed. I talked to Paul Washer about this. He just looked at me very humbly. He said, brother, he always comes. It's just that we're not desperate for him. How do you explain it? I know the aftermath of that experience was God gave me incredible boldness to witness. A deep sense, a pervasive sense of the fear of God. There was joy unspeakable and full of glory. And there was an intense attacks of the evil one in the days ahead. It was like now I had become a real threat to the kingdom of darkness. And I was hardly even a Christian. I had just come into the kingdom. Listen. Interestingly, we know that we have the person of Jesus resident within and the person of the Holy Spirit. But what does Paul refer to when he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? He is speaking, brethren, of a spirit wrought awareness which entails an enlivening of faith. The Holy Spirit, therefore, The consequence is that he makes Jesus real in our spiritual walk. Whereas there is literally this tangible sense of the presence of God. For some people, it lasts for many minutes or hours or days. Other people like me, it's as if he comes, he restores, he ministers, he quickens, and then he moves quickly on. Secondly, another benefit of being strengthened with might is you'll find, he said, that you being rooted and grounded in love. You'll notice here there's no qualifying statement describing what this love encompasses, what relationship it's pertinent to. Therefore, we have to assume that this is a love that really entails all relationships. Vertically with God and horizontally with with the saints as well as people that are unsaved. The love mentioned here is not qualified. The idea here is that the grace of love has been so firmly planted in our hearts that it affords a dimension of love that extends to all relationships, not just to God, but to all men, all men everywhere. For example, here's an implication. With God, even though I do not experience His presence all the time, I am raised to a whole different level of consciousness and a conscious love for God. I love Him. It's as if it is beyond me and my capability. With man... I'm enabled to love my enemies and love the most undesirable saints. Suddenly I start seeing things beyond their lives as to why they act the way they do. And it engenders compassion in my heart for them. I care for them and love them. And even though I may not know them well, I don't pray in a condescending way, but I pray because I feel for them. Another thing, 
The result of being strengthened with might by the Spirit is in verse 18. Paul said that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, watch it now, what is the width and length and depth and height, speaking of the love of Christ and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. By the way, the word in verse 19, to know, means to perceptively feel. Once again, this is subjective. He says to perceptively feel the love of Christ which passes knowledge. The word there means to throw beyond the intellect. In other words, I see, I know how much Jesus loves me, but now... There's this all-encompassing sense of the manifestation or manifested reality of Christ's love. The word comprehend means to spiritually perceive or grasp a dimension of Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. Listen to me, brethren. Matthew Henry, the devotional commentator, said, where Christ dwells, He swells. He's in us. But suddenly the Spirit quickens us in the inner man and we're able to grasp a dimension of Christ that is subjective in nature. Have you ever known what Paul talked about when he said, It's not the love for Christ that constrains me. It's the love of Christ. Quite honestly, I can't can't tell you this afternoon that, that I've not been driven at times just by my academic or theological knowledge of the love of Christ. At times it does inspire me. But friend, that pales in comparison to being spirit driven when the Holy Spirit comes and quickens that reality to your heart and you begin to experience and live in the dimension of the love of Christ. By the way, there's 10,000 miles difference between knowing how much Jesus loves you and experiencing the love of Jesus after the Spirit. At times in my life, I come in, I sing these songs about the love of Christ. It inspires me academically. But when God comes and the love of Christ becomes a reality, it throws it beyond the intellect. Now you're sitting there and you're looking at me like I'm from another planet, aren't you? But I'm talking about spiritual reality, friend. And I'm talking about something, if we pray in earnest for, who knows, perhaps God may not only give it to us, but give it to our church. And once again, this is what's lacking today in our churches of why we're not making a greater impact on our community is because we lack the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to be strengthened with might in the inner man. And then number four, the fourth benefit of being strengthened is that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The word filled here in the Greek means to be filled up or to be equipped or supplied with. The reality is, friend, is that the Ephesians and each of us may know the riches of the person of God himself. To think that God is the one that took the initiative to send His Son into the world to not only redeem us, but to give us the full measure of Himself is glorious. Now now think about this with me for a moment. To think that the very God in whom we move and breathe and have our being has given us such a promise is indescribable. And what is the promise? Verse 19, that we might be strengthened with might by the Holy Spirit in order 
that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice something. We don't just encounter God. We're filled with God. And beyond that, he says, we're filled with all the fullness of God. He holds nothing back. Paul says that we might be filled with God. It is a glorious thought to be enabled to encounter God is an awesome token of his love for us. But then Paul prays on top of that, that that, that, that filling would advance to the measure of fullness. I love the comments of Barnes here. Listen to what he says. This expression is a favorite word with Paul. He speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles, the fullness of time, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the Godhead in Christ. In Colossians 1 verse 19 and Colossians 2 and verse 9. But it means here, now this is so important, we're almost through, listen to this. It means here that you have the richest measures of divine consolation from above, God Himself, and the divine presence, that you may partake of the entire enjoyment of God in the most ample measure in which He bestows His favors upon His people. Why would I want anything else if I have God? And guess what? As we talked about last night, Christ is not only mighty to save, but he's mighty in his willingness to save. God is not only able to give you his fullness, he wants to do it. It's his desire to do it. But are you desperate for it? So in conclusion... It is a fitting conclusion that we mention once again that this is exactly what you see in revival and spiritual awakening when God pours out His Spirit. In response to the prayers of God's people, His Spirit comes and awakens these realities to our heart in such an extent that they become, listen, so life-giving life-giving, that our lives are mightily transformed. We grow in our spiritual understanding so as to see clearly, to see clearly and know powerfully, the, this is what we're talking about now, the riches of His glory. That's what the text said. These four things are the riches of His glory. We're able to see it and wrap our mind around it and internalize it. We experience it because it's given by the Spirit through the strengthening might of His grace. Such things as the indwelling Christ, a love for others, Christ's love for us, and the full measure of God's favor and presence is more and more apprehended. And I'll leave you with this parting word. It's worth asking the Father for. We love theology. And I pray that more and more God would give you an insatiable appetite for the truth about Himself. But friend, please do not stop there. There is a subjective reality to encounter. Learn to know and enjoy and practice the presence of God. This is what's lacking today in reform circles. Personal testimony. I asked Brother Paul, why am I not experiencing this on a more regular basis? He looked at me and said, Brother Don, perhaps you've become too civilized. You can answer people with a theological answer. But you don't know the life-giving grace 
of the truth that you're dispensing. And he didn't say it as if that was my problem. He just suggested that. And once again, he said to me, he always comes. You want to know why we don't encounter him? Because of the barrenness of busyness. God's people are too busy for God. We're too caught up in the trinkets and novelty of just talking about truth. We need to know truth in an experiential way. I don't know about you. My prayer is more love to be of Christ, more love to be. Not to consume it upon my lust, friend, but I, I really believe the more I know of the love of Christ, the more my Father is glorified. And it's all to the praise of the glory of His grace. Let's pray again. Father, deliver me from passivity. Deliver your people from passivity. Deliver us from busyness. Help us to learn to secure the presence of God. Oh, yes, Lord. There are other aspects relating to this topic. There are times where it's almost as if you play hide and seek with us. You intentionally keep your presence at a distance from us to try our faith. And we must cover that as well, but there's no time to. But Lord, oftentimes the reason we don't know this tangible sense of your presence is just because we're just too preoccupied with the affairs of the world. And so I would pray for your church. I pray for the churches that are represented here that you would strengthen them with might by your spirit in the inner man. I pray, God, in faith. I pray that you would quicken your word to people's hearts. That yes, they would know Christ academically, theologically, but they would also know him as a felt Christ. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would be so evident in their congregations that they would be filled with all the fullness of God, that they would know love beyond knee deep, and that more and more they might be encompassed and enriched by an ongoing sense of the love of Christ. Thank you for this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.